Hey, welcome back, everyone. So um, thanks for coming again this morning. And today we have our first talk from Giuseppe Canone, who's going to discuss the strategies for data collection. Giuseppe? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for uh, coming back at 9.30 in the morning. It's a challenge, help me. So I'd like to start. Uh, so the topic for today is data collection. I'd like to start saying that we are not going to be discussing how to set up data collection with a particular software, but rather we'll be looking at what are the uh, practical aspects that we need to take into account when setting up data collection. Those are uh, universal concepts that can be applied uh, anywhere, regardless of the energy, the microscope, the software, the facility, the nation, the county, wherever you are. So as in your ex uh, any other experiment in the lab, data collection has two parts. One is the planning, and the other one is the execution. When we think about planning, the first thing that we need to consider is resolution. So we, we like to, gi to give this, uh, this point a number, but in reality, we should ask ourselves, what is the information that I need in order to answer my, my biological question? This is really important, because everything else will uh, move around that. So one thing that we need to take into account when we want, we want to set this goal is sample. So what the sample is like and what we can do with this sample. As Katrina has mentioned already, so this is the most limiting factor at the moment in Korea. The other thing that we need to take into account is how we're going to be collecting this data. And this is, can be, we, we will be discussing this soon. And the other thing is how many data do I need in order to reach this goal. Next step is we, we're ready, we have a plan, we want to collect data. Generally, a, a data collection workflow looks like this, has a six steps, so you will lo be loading the samples. We'll, this will much depend on the type of the system that you'll be using. It can be an autoloader, or a semi-automated system, or perhaps a side entry holder. Next, you'll be deciding the detector that you want to use and uh, which features of the detector you want to use. Then you'll be deciding uh, how you want the illumination that you want to use. We call this setting optics. Then you will be tuning the microscopes and perhaps the filter if you need an energy filter. Decide the, data, the software that you want to use to collect data and eventually press run. And if the microscope doesn't crash, you'll be end up with a nice, beautiful data set the day after. <clears throat> so when, uh, when executing a data, collection, uh, a data collection workflow, the first things that we need to look is we need to find a good sample. So generally, assuming that you have access to high-end technology, so generally, a good sample is a sample that looks monodispersed and homogeneous uh, and is embedded in thin vitreous size, is randomly oriented, and has very strong signal-to-noise ratio, so possibly you want to see the particles, and has a strong isotopic throne rings. So once you have selected the right sample, or you think you, are, you have the right sample, so the next question is the detector. So Greg yesterday already spoke about detectors and what, how they work, what they can do. So I'd like to uh, uh, just mention one thing. So the thing that we need to take into account is the DQE. The DQE stands for Detector Quantum Efficiency. Put in layman terms, what the DQE tells us is how good is our detector as a function, what is the performance of our detector as a function of the spatial frequencies, Be, uh, with the highest spatial frequencies being our, uh, twice the big, uh, our Nyquist, which is twice of the pixel size. When you, when you select a detector, so this day we'll be using direct electron detectors. They can operate in two modes, integrating or counted. So there is a big difference between the two modes, and you can use this strategically for your sample, for your data collection. So if we look at the integrating mode, the DQE, so it, this is just a schematic. The reality is slightly different. So if we take in consideration an integrating uh, detector, a, a detector operating in integrating mode, so the DQE will look rather flat. If we take into account, instead, if we consider the DQE of a detector operating in counting mode, the DQE will look, will look like this, will tend to fall off as we approach to the Nyquist frequency. So what, the detect, what, these, two li what these two lines are telling us is, how good is our detector in detecting the particle? And how good the electron, sorry, and how good is our detector in localizing the electron? So as we can see, that, uh, 
if the detector is operating in uh, integrating mode, it's not so good in localizing, but is slightly better in, uh, uh, sorry, it's not so good in uh, uh, <coughs> detecting, but is slightly better in localizing. On the contrary, if we take into consideration a counting detector is really good in detecting, but is not so good in localizing. So how do we use this information? With this information, can be used to decide, uh, based on the particle size that we are working, what type of, uh, uh, what type of detector we want to use. If you're working with large particles, perhaps an integrating mode can help you. So remember that integrating mode is a lot faster than counting and it can, uh, can give you the information that you're looking for in a quicker way. If we working with uh, smaller particles, then we can use, uh, a count it's better to use a counting detector because counting detector can see the particles slightly better compared to the integrating mode. So the other thing that we need to, uh, to take into account is the performance at the different spatial frequencies. One thing that we can uh, consider is once we have a resolution goal, we can uh, look at the DQE and we can ask ourselves, how is this detector performance performing at the resolution that I have in mind. Is it good or is it bad? And you can change this, uh, this resolution, so you can shift this information toward the higher part of the, uh, uh, the uh, more sensitive part of the, uh, the detector. Bear in mind that uh, if, you, uh, if you're doing this, you sampling at a higher, uh, uh, higher uh, 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 yeah, you're sampling higher and you're reducing the field of view. So it is true that you can reach the resolution that you want, perhaps in a quicker way, but you're losing, you're losing, you will need a lot more images and you will have to, uh, to process a lot more images as well. So this is not really, uh, this is not really good. This can be, this is not really good if your sample is already good, but can be, good, can be a nice strategy to adapt if you have, you're struggling to reach the resolution that you want. So the other things that we need to consider when choose the detector, is the dose rate, total dose, and fraction. So the DQE uh, detectors perform better at different dose rate. Dose rate. And uh, uh, the DQE is also a function of the dose rate. Different detectors have, uh, uh, as a function of the dose rate. So what we need to keep in mind is dose rate is the number of electrons per pixel per second. It's usually expressed as EPX per second. So higher dose rate will uh, give you lower DQE, but much higher throughput. This is a good thing to keep in mind if your sample is really heterogeneous and lead a lot of data. Lower dose rate will have a higher DQE, lower throughput. This is, you need, if you're working with a rock solid sample that you know that is homogeneous, is not that, uh, is homogeneous, is really stable. So then perhaps going to the lower, day, uh, lower, um, uh, lower dose rate can be advantageous for you. The other thing that we need to consider is the total dose rate, which is the number of uh, electrons per unit area. A uh, good uh, range is between 30 and 60 electrons per angstrom square. So the total dose rate really depends on, uh, on the particles that you are working. If you're working on smaller particles, perhaps you want to, get, uh, you want to use a higher total dose rate, and have, uh, uh, this, will input, uh, this will affect your throughput because you will have lower throughput. If you're working with larger particle, you can uh, uh, you can lower you can have less uh, total dose, and you can have higher throughput. Finally, the fractions. Fraction is the number of frames in a movie. So as we know, we collect we no longer collect just one image, but we collect basically a movie. We fractionate the exposure in order to uh, to reduce uh, uh, to reduce movement and other other things um, that are happening during the data collection. So uh, a good, a good uh, so each of these fraction will need will need to have a certain amount of signal in order to uh, uh, to be meaningful for the software then that will perform the what we call it motion core. So this also can be a, is a parameter that needs to be adjusted based on your uh, on your re your resolution goal. <coughs> Remember that less fractions improve the throughput can have higher throughput because these frames will need to be written to disk and this takes time. So we'll give you smaller uh, movies, which is always good because you will have less data to, to handle and it can improve the pre-processing, which is in this case is motion core. So if you, if you fractionate more, you will have uh, lower throughput because it will take longer for the software to write the frames to the disk. You will have larger movie, which can be a challenge to move around and to process. 
and you also will have lo uh, slower processing. Another thing that we we often uh, uh, we we need to take into account is uh, when choosing when uh, using the detector is the gain reference. So as Greg mentioned, a detector has, is um, is an array of pixels. Each pixel uh, behaves differently when uh, uh, an electron is uh, uh, when in contact with an electron. So we need to take into account of these differences. And the way we do this, we estimate the gain. So the gain attempts to normalize the behavior of each of these pixels in order to have a flatter image. <laughs> so uh, the gain reference is not the only type of reference that uh, we'll be using. Uh, there is also a dark reference. So the dark, dark reference is essentially uh, the soft, the uh, sorry, the, the detector needs to be kept at certain temperature. Now, this uh, uh, while operating the detector, because of the electronic, might, there, there might be some slight flu fluctuation of the electronics, and this might change the temperature of the electron uh, of the detector. So we need to, and this results in noise. So we need to take into account this uh, this noise, and this is done to the dark reference. The way we get we arrive to the gain corrected um, image is to is the detector will take an unprocessed image. It will remove the noise, the dark noise, and then multiply by the gain, and will give us a, this uh, corrected image. So one thing that we need to remember is that the gain reference must be acquired close to the dose rate. So as I already said, what we are trying to measure there is the behavior or we, the response of the electron to a certain dose rate. Okay. And the other thing that we need to remember is that the gain reference is not magnification dependent. It's only flux dependent. It's only dose rate dependent. So you can take the magnification. You can take a, a gain reference at any magnification. What matters is that the illumination is homogeneous and it match the dose rate that you are going to use. Uh, yeah, it match the dose rate. So when we when uh, considering uh, what is the the best detector for uh, for our uh, experiment. What we need to consider is what is the, resol the resolution goal. So if you're trying uh, to reach to very high resolution, perhaps you want to choose the best detector that you have available. The best detector might not always be the fastest detector. So the other thing that we need to consider is what detector you have, you have available. So these days there are quite few out there, and we are lucky at the LMB that we have quite all of them. Of course, is your sample. So, if depending on the size, if you're working with uh, a large sample or a smaller sample, you might choose an integrating mode or a counting mode, depending what you're trying to do. And uh, the other thing we need to consider is the heterogeneity. So, uh, we are tempted to set uh, the detector to, to choose the best detector, which in, sometimes might be the slowest detector to reach very high resolution. But this might not be the best case if we have a very heterogeneous sample. So if, if we have a heterogeneous sample, we might want to choose the fastest detector, perhaps performing at uh, uh, different with lower DQE. So overexposing is better than underexposing. This is only in the case if you're collecting movies. So many, many, uh, most of us are always concerned about radiation damage. So you don't have to worry about radiation damage at this stage. This will be taken care of by the software later in uh, in uh, the data processing. Uh, now we understand that, uh, the DQE, so possibly look for uh, the best the, the detector with the best DQE, and you can you understand how you can control the DQE to your advantage. And finally, you need to consider what is the time available to collect and process these images. So these days, microscopes are extremely high throughput. Probably we'll get even uh, even uh, even more in the future. So considering how much time you have and how much space you have and what is the computing infrastructure that you have available to process this image can be can make a huge difference in your experiment so the next thing that we need to consider is the the optics so most of the time you will have uh, uh, some uh, this you will have available some settings that the facility probably has already chosen for you all you will have to do is to adjust these optics for your experiment there are a few things that are uh, extremely important when choosing it, when uh, setting the optics. One of this is setting uh, uh, parallel illumination. So depending, so parallel illumination can be achieved, uh, uh, is, is achieved by setting uh, the last crossover of the condenser system in the front focal plane of the objective lens, and the last crossover of the objective lens in the back focal plane of the objective lens. 
So when this condition is met, the beam going through your sample is parallel. So I'll tell you a secret. The, the, the beam is never, never really, really parallel, but it's close, as close as parallel as it gets. So depending on the, on the type of microscope that you're using, if it's two lens condenser system, like a Glacios, or if a three lens condenser system, like a Cryos, it might be more or less challenging. If you're using a, um, if you're using a two lens condenser system, the best way to set up parallel illumination is to use the facility settings so you don't end up in trouble. All you need to remember is that uh, for two lens condenser system, you only have one setting that is parallel, so you can no longer change the beam, okay? If you're losing a, a, a three lens condenser system, in the case of uh, Cryos, so the manufacturer has uh, introduced this uh, third lens, whose job is essentially to keep the last crossover of the condenser system in the front focal plane of the objective lens. So it doesn't matter how you change the C2. What the C3 will be doing will be compensating so that this crossover stays right there. So if this is the case, then you will have a wider range of uh, parallel illumination. And if you want to know if the illumination is parallel or not, what you can do, at least in the Thermo Fisher system, you can open this panel, beam settings, and you will have here the information. As I said, bear in mind that it, the parallel illumination is only possible for a certain range. Okay, so, and this is extremely important to remember because if you end up in a condition of divergent beam, like in this case, you might end up collecting not so good images. And uh, there are two main problems when you work with non-parallel illumination. First of all, the focus might change across your image. Second, you might have differential magnification across the image, and this gets even worse when you're doing tomography. Okay, so parallel illumination, if you want to collect good data, parallel illumination is a good thing to remember. The, the, the other thing that we need to take into account is the, uh, the beam size. So as we get, uh, as project becomes more and more challenging, we tend to get, we want to collect more and more data. Collecting more and more data might not be always the, the smart option because you might end up in troubles or in uh, collecting uh, bad images because of the charging and beam induced uh, motion. So Chris, has highlighted this in this paper in 2016, but the reality is that this was already shown before by Niger, Richard, Bob Glaser, and other people. So the best way to expose your sample is to have a symmetric, uh, to expose uh, um, homogeneously your target hole. So in this case, what happened is that the, all the forces that are up, that acting on, uh, on, uh, on the foil or on, on your sample are essentially distributed. And this reduces uh, a lot charging and beam induced motion. As you diverge from this condition, so basically you start shifting the beam away, you start illuminating less and less the foil in order to fit more and more exposure, this problem becomes stronger and stronger with the worst case scenario where we fit a lot of exposure within the hole and we end up not illuminating the, uh, the foil. So this is the worst case scenario, and you, get, you will end up uh, uh, collecting a lot of charging and beam induced motion. If you want to avoid this problem, the best things to do, or if you have no option, you just need to increase your throughput because you have very heterogeneous sample and you want to understand what's going on. The best things to do is probably use uh, some sort of uh, support on your foil, so in order to reduce the charging. The best, uh, the best support you can use is graphene, but we learned yesterday from Katerina that graphene is still a challenge to produce. So if you have no other option, you can use carbon foil or you can use graphene oxide. So uh, one last consideration is uh, in future, this, uh, in future probably soon, this, uh, uh, this condition will, uh, will soon be met. We, yesterday we learned that there is a new type of support, which is the X-foil. X-foil has a very, very small hole. And uh, uh, it's very difficult to make a beam smaller than 200 uh, nanometers. So fitting more exposure in a 200 nanometer uh, uh, hole will be a challenge. So with the small hole, what you will end up at, uh, you will uh, most, yeah, we will end up having uh, one exposure per hole. And then uh, and, uh, uh, this will allow you to collect a high quality image and also have a lot of throughput. So the other things that we, we, we need to, to take into account is, uh, uh, is the, uh, 
the, what we used to call fringe free imaging. Fringe free imaging is, uh, is uh, really a marketing name that has been put out there. So the real name of fringe free imaging is coelar illumination. So the idea behind this is uh, it comes from uh, light microscopy. And the idea is that uh, we want to make uh, the illumination as homogeneous as possible. In electron microscopy, this was not possible until few, until few, few years ago and because of the fringes. So uh, these fringes are generated because the C2 aperture is out of focus. And uh, the C2 aperture basically scatters electrons and we end up having this. Uh, some people might, uh, might call ugly. I think that those are beautiful fringes because they'll ask how, beautiful, how good is your illumination. Uh, in this case, is the electron gun. So because of these fringes, in the past, we had to make the beam a lot larger because we did not want to record this imperfection. And this was reducing the throughput because we could not fit as many ex uh, exposure as we could in, uh, in the hole. So with, um, uh, what, I've done, what the manufacturer have done in this, uh, over the, the year, so is that they, they, they adjust the illumination. So the C2 is now in focus on your sample, means you remove the fringes. And you end up with this beautiful beam that can be seen as a fringe free. This allows you to increase the amount of exposure per hole and increase you to have higher throughput. So fringe free is not really fringe free. So nothing is free in this, in this world. So if we look uh, at the beam here, uh, the, the fringes, as I said, are a result of the fact that the C2 is not in focus on the spaceman. <coughs> so you can bring the C2 in focus by changing the focus knob. So in a fringe free system, when, collecting, when we collect data, we tend to use defocus in order to improve the contrast. So in a, uh, when, uh, when working with a fringe, fringe system, you need, um, you need to be careful when making this sort of uh, uh, exposure. Because by changing the defocus, the number of fringes will change. And if the number of fringes will change and you use an illumination like this, then you might be recording this imperfection, which is basically will be deteriorating your images. So rule of, rule of thumb is OK to make the beam smaller, but not too tight. So always, always try to make it slightly bigger than the detector. So <clears throat> uh, what we need to remember when, uh, uh, setting, when choosing the, the right illumination, two things. Make sure that the beam is parallel. We have seen what are the problems, which is different defocus across the image and differential magnification. And this is even worse if we are doing a, a tomography. The other thing is we needed to illuminate the spaceman support. So always make the beam, uh, the beam slightly bigger and try to illuminate the foil. So this will reduce beam induced motion and charging. So the next step is uh, uh, tuning the microscope. When tuning the microscope, <coughs> first things we need to do is take into account the eccentricity. So the eccentricity is this point in the microscope where uh, when the, uh, your sample is tilted, you see no image shift. So if we, consider, if we take in consideration this, uh, this case, we see the sample is being tilted, and what we see is that the image is shifting sideways. If the, the sample is heliocentric, which is basically we raise the stage with the Z, so then uh, if we, we are at the centric point, the, there is no image shift. This alignment is important. It's important for uh, quite a few reasons. The first reason is because wrong eccentricity is the cause of most failed data collection. Um, wrong eccentricity is not only the, the, the cause of uh, failed data collection, but it's also the cause of some imperfection. If the eccentricity is wrong, you will have also um, different magnification, differential, different magnification. And uh, the other thing is that if the eccentricity is wrong, uh, most of some of the alignments that you'll be doing, there can be also wrong. In fact, some of the alignment tend to, to be good alignment because of the fact that you are not working at the eccentricity. So the, one of the really important alignments that we need to, we, we need to uh, I'd like to bring up is the beam tilt. So beam tilt as discussed by, also by, by, by Richard and Chris. So uh, it, we usually, rep, we call the beam tilt axial coma. And it's an, an image aberration that is introduced when the illumination is not parallel to the optical axis of the objective lens. So this is the case. So as you can see here, so the illumination is centering the objective lens at an angle. And what 
turn, uh, uh, the image that is formed looks like a, a comet. That's the reason why we call it coma. So this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this coma or beam tilt, usually we refer this as a, to beam tilt, can be fixed by using uh, the Zemlin tableau. So this process is is automated, and uh, can uh, uh, this process is automated and is really uh, is easily done through all the software for data collection that are out there. So the we will see why I'll, I'll show you later on in uh, the in uh, in the presentation why beam tilt is uh, is really really uh, uh, something important we need to take into account. So the other thing is the we need to 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 discuss is the objective aperture. The objective aperture is um, a physical piece of metal which has got holes, and it sits in the back focal plane of the objective lens where there is the, you can see the uh, live Fourier transform. So this is a scattering from uh, ultrafoil. It's not, uh, is, is not a, a biological sample. So do not expect to see something like this. So what we want to, want we, I want to show you is that um, uh, we tend to think that the objective aperture is uh, limiting our resolution. So the objective aperture might be li limiting your resolution in some cases, in the cases where you collect in very high pixel size. So, but in normal cases, for normal experiment, the objective aperture is not limiting your, uh, your resolution. So if you're using uh, a 100 micron objective aperture, <coughs> you see that uh, all the information up to 1.4, so this is the gold diffraction uh, at 1.431 angstrom. So all the informations are there. So if you are collecting, if you are collecting data at one angstrom per pixel, your Nyquist will be two. So two is inside the objective aperture, okay? Reality is that two is also inside a 70 micron objective aperture. So the, 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 good, the good things of using an objective aperture is that the objective aperture, what it does is remove the high spatial frequencies and act as a low pass filter. So low pass filter improves, gives you a little bit better contrast. And you can see this here. So if you compare this image where there is no objective aperture with this image where there is a 70 micron, you can see that there is, there is a difference. You can see details a little bit better. So this is particularly important if you're doing uh, tomography, where uh, you're working already at very low dose. And anything that can bring you a little bit, uh, can increase a little bit the signal to noise is a gain, okay? This is also very good if you're working uh, with single particles and you're trying to work very close to focus. So anything that improves the signal to noise is always good to take into account. The so the other thing that we need to, uh, to discuss is the objective lens astigmatism. So astigmatism means something that is not circular. So lenses, although they are highly engineered and uh, the manufacturer take care to make them as good as possible, they are still not perfectly circular. And um, uh, this is shown by taking an image and looking at the uh, power spectrum. So if we take a power spectrum, a piece of uh, carbon, we see that uh, uh, if the, if the power spectrum is circular, then uh, there is no objective lens astigmatism. However, if we look, uh, uh, if, the, um, if the power spectrums look like oval, parallel, or even hyperbolic, then there is, some, there is astigmatism. And this astigmatism can be slight astigmatism or very severe astigmatism. This astigmatism can be fixed, and the way you fix it is to use, again, automated routines that are in all the data uh, automated data collection softwares. So you don't have to do, uh, you literally just have to press a button. Uh, when, uh, so finally, when tuning uh, or where fine tuning the microscope, what we need to remember is that uh, the tuning should be performed in the data collection settings, possibly using a spaceman like, a standard spaceman like a replica -like grating. So these days, microscopes are really, really, really stable. And really, like, you only need to do very few alignments. The way you can check if the microscope that you're using is a good system is uh, to, uh, to take uh, one of these uh, uh, standard spacemen, take an image, do, um, uh, do uh, check what, is the, what the power spectrum looks like. And if it does look like something like this, then your system is perfect. Not perfect, but it's good enough to collect good data. A uh, replica grating can also be a good tool to identify issues like uh, vibrations or uh, uh, drift or uh, aberration like astigmatism or beam tilt. 
So the take-home message is uh, take-home message here is that uh, we this day we are using more and more uh, foil, gold foil. So you need to remember that gold foil doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't have thorn rings. Okay. So and you will need a carbon support or something to align the microscope. So the best way you can uh, the best samples you can use to align the microscope and to check if the microscope is actually good to go is to use the replica grid. So once again, we, what we needed to remember, always work at your centric height. So this is, again, responsible. So a successful uh, data collection most of the time fail because of your centric height. As I said, you only need very few alignments. So the alignments that you need to do is beam shift or tomo beam shift if you're doing tomography, uh, beam tilt, uh, objective lens astigmatism, and center the objective attention. Remember that bad alignments can have an impact on other experiments. So if you're not sure, always ask. There is nothing wrong in asking, OK? And uh, possibly use the objective aperture. This can be a good tool to improve some of your, um, uh, uh, to, improve some, uh, to improve the imaging. So the, the, the other things, I think I went a little bit too fast. <laughs> so the, the other thing that we need to, to, to discuss is the energy filters. So as Chris mentioned, energy filter is a tool that is used to remove inelastic scattered electrons. So these electrons are uh, electrons that um, they do not contribute much to the imaging. In future, we might reuse these, uh, these electrons. But, but at the moment, we don't, uh, we, don't need these, we don't want these electrons in our image. So the way we remove these electrons is by bending the, the beam, by making the beam pass through, uh, through a prism. So all the energy gets uh, uh, separated. And uh, what happens is that um, on this plane, we will have this spectrum. So this is the energy loss spectrum. And here we have all sorts of, sort of energy. We have the electrons that have not lost energy. We refer to this as a zero loss peak. And then we have an, uh, electrons that have lost energy. So the way we select these, uh, these electrons is by introducing the famous slit. So it's a physical device that gets inserted in, uh, in uh, in the filter and only allows these electrons to pass through and then form the image, OK? So the, the effect of uh, this filtering can be seen in these two images. So we see that the, an image, this image is filtered, where we can see this, uh, the sample a little bit better, while compared here, where it's a lot more blurred. So regardless of uh, the manufacturer, uh, there are, uh, so uh, filters are like a microscope. They have imperfection, and we need to fix this imperfection if we want to collect the good data. So regardless of the manufacturer, filters will uh, attempt to fix three main, uh, uh, three main things. So the first thing is the isochromaticity. So as we said, what we try to do is to remove the uh, inelastic scattered electron. So this is done through uh, the insertion of a slit. Now, what we need to make sure that it, this energy is properly selected. And the way we do this is by running this isochromaticity. What the isochromaticity does is to attempt to center the, uh, uh, the energy loss, uh, the, the spectrum on the slit plane. This allows us to select the right energy and then to create a good image. So we are all familiar with this, uh, with this, uh, this schematic. So this is what we see when we tend to tune the bioquantum, the uh, Gatan energy filter. So if this chromatism is not tuned, we see a spectrum of energy. What we are interested in is in this energy. And this is what the filter is doing. By changing this plane, it allows us to select just the good the energy we are interested on, uh, we are interested in. And that's the reason why we have, from a colorful image, we end up with a plain orange image. The other thing we tend to, to fix is geometric distortion. So this can be of any sort. Can be uh, the image is not properly centered in, uh, in, um, on the detector. Can be magnification distortion, change of magnification. Can be rotation, tilt. Can be all sorts of uh, things. So the way the filter attempts to fix this, this uh, geometric distortion is by using a mask. The filter knows what the mask looks like. Well, the software, actually. The software knows what the, field, uh, the, the mask looks like. And uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, take an image of the mask, we'll analyze the image, and then change the lenses so that the image fits what you had in mind. OK? 
so the the final alignments that we need to uh, to the uh, that we need to discuss is chromatic distortion. So as we said, is the the idea of the energy filter is to select zero loss and uh, uh, zero loss uh, electrons that are elastically scattered. So what happened is that while reprojecting while repro while reprojecting these electrons to create a, uh, an image, these electrons can have uh, an energy spread. And uh, uh, this energy spread will cause blur. So if we want to, if we want, we can reduce this blur by uh, by running this chromatic distortion. So uh, the way the filter does is again insert a, a mask, and it looks at this uh, uh, what the mask looks like. So here you see that the holes are um, they have a black and white halo. So what is telling us here is essentially that the, there is an energy spread. What will fi the filter will do is to, or the software will do is to analyze these holes. Will then adjust the lenses so that the image becomes a plain green, uh, gray image. So here the chromatic distortion has been fixed or has been uh, minimized. So what we need to consider when uh, using energy filter? Really, what we need to uh, to consider is energy filter. Um, alignments, um, the, the alignments of the energy filter are magnification dependent. So if you change the magnification, we showed why they are magnification dependent. We are fixing geometric distortion. This depends on the magnification. So uh, if you change, if you, during your data collection, you decide that you want to increase the sampling or reduce the sampling, you will need to retune the, the energy filter. The other thing that we need to remember is that filters are uh, highly sensitive to temperature, especially the slit. The slit is really, really, really sensitive. Any fluctuation inside of the room or any fluctuation inside of the box will cause this to drift. If the slit or any of the lenses drift, then you will end up with uh, not bad images, but not the images that you, the, qual the quality that you wanted to, to uh, you were hoping to get. Worst case scenario, the slit might drift so much that will uh, uh, will give you just black images, and those images are really useless. So please remember to close the enclosure. <clears throat> so finally, data collection strategies. So these days, uh, so when collecting data, there are uh, we go through. Uh, so the idea. Of, so when we collect data, what essentially we do is we we um, we the info, yeah to collect data we need a few few images. So the first images that we need is we need to understand, uh, we need to uh, have an atlas of, or an overview of our grid, okay? So this atlas is usually taken a low magnification. So through this atlas, we can then identify whether the, where the, uh, what's the, uh, the ice thickness. We can identify where there are broken area, so we can steer away from this area. So we basically, through this atlas, we identify where we want to go and collect data. The next step is to uh, to the next step is to collect the images of a grid square or hexagon if you're using Xpoint. So this is usually is at higher mag. At this magnification, we'll have an image like this, and uh, here is where we start seeing uh, where the positions where we want to collect uh, where we want to collect. So what we do here is we select all the positions that we think uh, are useful for our imaging. We discard position with contamination and perhaps with uh, 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 um, uh, ice that is not uh, is not good for us. So once we have selected this position, what uh, what we what we do is we ramp up the the magnification. So we'll uh, uh, a higher mag will center each of these position. We'll then uh, uh, the microscope will then uh, uh, perform autofocus, and then we'll collect the data. So this loop will be run for as many positions as we have selected. So this way of collecting data is, is called accurate whole centering, uh, whole centering. So the idea is that for each of these positions, the microscope will move the hole in the center of the, te the detector, will perform autofocus, will acquire data. Now, there is another way we can use in order to collect data. So once we have centered the first hole, okay, what we can do instead of moving the next, the neighbor hole, back to the, uh, to the center of the detector, we can shift the beam and collect still an image. So this method is called faster acquisition as a general way. And this, uh, this is a very clever way to collect data because it allows us to increase the throughput 
two, two, uh, between two and three times. So if we go a little bit into more details, the way it works is like this. So as we said, uh, normally we would be collecting images by center, by centering the target hole in the center of our detector. The beam will go through, create an image, and this image will be recorded on the detector. The way the faster acquisition works is, instead of moving the neighbor hole in the center, what he will be doing is he will shift the beam to the neighbor uh, position. The, the electrons will scatter, the image will be reformed in the center of the detector by using image deflection coil. So as you can see, uh, so, this, uh, yeah, so this method uh, can be called, has a different name depending on the software that you are using. If you are using EPU, we will call it um, uh, aberration free image shift. If we'll be using CLM, it will be called uh, active beam tilt compensation. Why these fancy names? So these fancy names come from the fact that, as you can see, when we record in the neighbor's uh, hole away from the center of the optical axis, the beam is not going in the center of the objective lens. If your beam is not going in the center of the objective lens, as we, say, as we know, we have a beam tilt. Beam tilt is a killer for uh, your uh, resolution. And this effect becomes more and more severe as you get away from the center, uh, from, the, uh, from the optical axis. So Chen and colleague estimated that if the microscope is really well aligned, uh, beam image shift up to three to four microns should, will not kill your resolution up to three angstroms. However, if you want to go higher, so this effect needs to be taken into account. So the, so the way this effect is taken into account is to uh, figure it out how much beam tilt or how much coma you can accumulate per micron of beam image shift. So this is done through a calibration. What the software will do, will uh, shift the beam further and further and further and will estimate the beam tilt. Once he knows how much beam tilt there is per micron of image shift, what we'll do is that during data collection, as the beam gets shifted away from the optical axis, this correction will be applied, and all you will get is an, e an image that is without the beam tilt, okay? Now, the uh, reality is that these images, although, although they are uh, visually without beam tilt, you might have that some images might have some residual beam tilt. The residual beam tilt depends on how good this calibration has been uh, done. So if you're using EPU, uh, the manufacturer doesn't want uh, users to, 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 to do the calibration. This calibration can be dangerous for, uh, for users, especially, especially if it's messed up, and the, 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 uh, the manufacturer prefer users don't do this. There is a way you can check. There is the easy way and the hard way. Here I'm gonna show you what is the hard way. So uh, if you're using CLM, CLM is more, uh, more open, wants users to learn and take ownership of their experiment. So you will uh, be running the calibration. If you want to make sure that that calibration is done properly and is effective for your data collection, I do encourage you to use cross grating grid. Because as we said, the calibration, what the calibration will try to do is to measure the beam, t how much coma you have per micron of image shift. So you need to have a really nice, stable, and flat uh, sample specimen in order to, for this calibration to work at your own advantage. So in the hard way here, so what you see here is, um, this is um, a, uh, so, th so this, is, uh, uh, this is a data collection that we've done recently on, uh, on uh, uh, one of our systems. Uh, we took for granted that the calibration was done properly. We did not check that whether the calibration was done. And we collected data, we processed this data, and uh, we got stuck to a resolution. We were expecting a better resolution uh, because it was a poferity, not because it was a, uh, so we all know that a poferity is a really good standard to check, uh, uh, to check per microscope performance. So what we did is uh, we knew that we were using AFIS, and uh, we split uh, the data set per uh, AFIS groups in uh, rely on optic groups. So the way we split this data set was to, uh, so uh, by uh, the amount of beam image shift that was used to collect every single image. So this is essentially an AFIS, uh, uh, yeah, an AFIS type of data collection. So what we did was to then ask Reliant to estimate residual beam tilt. And turns out that there was, for every AFIS group, there was some degrees of beam tilt. 
some uh, in some cases the beam tilt was so bad was not that bad but was bad for the resolution we were working we were trying to uh, to get and we saw that the highest beam tilt we could find was at 0 0.4 milliride once Relion estimated uh, all these residual beam tilt, we reprocessed the data set, and we, the data set went from 1.95 to 1.55, which was a huge improvement. The data set, all, um, after that, the data set went, went even further down, but this is not what matters. So what I'm trying to say here is, uh, it, so this is the, so what I'm trying to say is here, if you do, uh, it, is, uh, it is always good to try to, if you're using app, it is always good to try to, set, uh, if, and you are expecting resolution to go below the three angstrom, it's always good to try to split your data set in APIS group or optics group and try to estimate the, the, the beam tilt. Then you might find that there, are, there is some residual beam tilt. For, uh, for what I can tell you, us as a facility, we, in any other microscope, we do check this calibration regularly. Every Monday, we do make sure that the, the, the calibration are, are, um, are OK. Yeah, so you should not be worried. But you're more than welcome to check. And if you find something wrong, please let us know. So the other thing that I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to discuss is the, the software that we use. So there are two main types of software that can be used for data collection. One is, uh, is easier than the other. Uh, they both have strength and, uh, and weakness. So the first one is EPU. EPU is, uh, is the one that we users use the most. It's very user friendly. It's only, it can only be used for, um, a, for a single particle data collection. It has a several routines that um, a, allows us to, uh, to be more productive. So as an automated atlas acquisition, grid mapping, and target selection. It has uh, alignments uh, routine for, to correct for beam tilt or coma free. Astigmatism correction. He has also this uh, uh, the office as we as I, I discussed before. So he can he can uh, he can be used to collect on several uh, type of uh, grid, including the X foil, and then has uh, several has two more um, feature, which is EPU multi grid that allows you to set up data collection different type of uh, uh, sample, and EQ, EPU quality monitor, which is basically the on the fly processing. Uh, uh, the on-the-fly processing routine. So the, the bad things of EPU is that it can only be used on the Thermo Fisher system, and uh, it can, uh, some of these features are not available on uh, other, uh, uh, older systems. So the, the other one that uh, you can use is the CLM. So CLM is, um, I believe, is probably one of the most powerful software for data collection out there. So he had a five-star rating, but eventually after uh, David Masterdar introduced the Python support, I think he went like a million stars uh, rating. So the Python support essentially allows you to control the microscope from a Jupyter notebook. Uh, is, uh, CLM is, uh, is very flexible and, uh, and is open source. It has, um, a, it has a very outstanding support, so David Masterdar is always on the computer answering to email. Uh, as a uh, routine like EPU to correct for uh, coma-free and astigmatism, as the, uh, the office uh, integrated, it allows you to collect, sorry, I cannot see, I think the battery is off. So it's, uh, it has, uh, uh, allows you to collect data and uh, uh, allows you to compress data, which is, comes always handy if you want to. Thank you, please. Always handy if you want to, uh, uh, to improve uh, processing after and save space. He supports uh, nearly all the manufacturers that are out there, uh, all the detectors that are out there. The, if you speak C++, you can even develop your own plugin. Uh, so it's really powerful. But it is um, the downside of CLM is he has a very steep learning curve. So as you can see, the interface looks very complicated. But once you understand how it works, it's relatively easy. So uh, uh, to wrap up, so those are the, the rules that I. I mean, they help me personally to, to get better and better in what, uh, what, uh, what they do. So remember to work at sp uh, spacement at the centric height so your data collection won't, won't fail. Embrace the defocus. So we tend to collect data closer and closer to focus because we hope to get the best high resolution that we, we can. Uh, again, most of the time you'll be limited by your sample and not by the microscope. So uh, be careful when you get closer and closer to focus because the software is not as precise as you think. It makes mistakes. 
it might be the case that instead of collecting image under focus, you are collecting some of the images over focus, and these images are not really useful for you. Remember parallel illumination, uh, use and center objective aperture if you're working at resolution of three angstroms. Correct the beam tilt, illuminate the, the foil, so do not try to squeeze as many images as you can. So you have plenty of position that you can collect out. One, one or two images will not make the difference in your data collection. Uh, choose a good detector, which again might not be the fastest one. Uh, use a cross grating for the tuning or if you're running a calibration like uh, uh, the APIS calibration in CLM. And please remember, quality is always better over quantity. So trying to wrapping up the, uh, the, the, the talk. So you have, uh, we have discussed about, so we, we have uh, a goal, which is basically the resolution. Again, we all hope to get uh, the best resolution that we can. But as has always been discussed before, um, these days we are, not, uh, we are not limited by, the, uh, by, the, by the, the, the hardware. We are mainly limited by the sample. So choose your target or your goal wisely. Uh, so this, this goal will depend, from, will depend on many factors. It will depend mainly from your sample and also from the imaging condition. So once you, have that your first, once you have done your first data collection and you have processed your images and you, have, you, you might get like a disappointing uh, resolution uh, or perhaps you are very excited about the resolution that you got. So I suppose the next question will be, if you get a disappointing resolution, is do I need more particles or better sample? So you can judge this with the tools like um, the B-factor plot, which is uh, something that was uh, uh, suggested by Peter Rosenthal and uh, Richard Anderson. So this is really a good tool to understand in which direction you are going. Is assuming that your system is 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 okay. Assuming that your microscope is is good. So the quest, So the, so this tool will allow you to uh, to figure it out if you you need uh, what 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 is the next step. Your, you might you might have a really bad sample and you will need to improve your uh, uh, your biochemistry. If that is the case, doesn't matter how many images you collect, doesn't matter which microscope you use, doesn't matter which fancy tools you use to process your images. You will not get to the, the goal that you're looking at, or you, you want to get. <laughs> However, if your sample is good, then uh, the B-factor plot will tell you, and then you can uh, estimate how many more images you need in order to reach the goal that you have in mind. So finally, here is uh, uh, some of the resources that I think are really useful for, uh, for learning more if you wish to, to go deeper in, uh, in this subject. So for uh, those of you who are here at the LMB, there is the MWiki, which is uh, a collection of protocols and uh, application notes from the different manufacturers, which it's, it uh, can help you to, uh, to set up data collection and also can help you to make a better decision or wiser decision when setting up data collection. So there are the past uh, CryoM course available, uh, courses available on YouTube. Then there is the, uh, the Grand Jensen course is still on YouTube. And there is this tool, EM Learning, which is uh, a collection of uh, a lot, a lot of lectures. So the lecture can go, can go, uh, it can be as deep as, as, you, <laughs> as you won't imagine how deep they can go. There is, is really a lot of information there. And I encourage you to go and look at these, uh, these things if you have time. And then there is CryoM 101, which is a recent uh, resources. So, and uh, I'd like to, uh, to conclude my talk, thank you, uh, uh, wishing to acknowledge, uh, well, thank, uh, to acknowledge all these people who are the M team. So we have uh, Shaosha, Anna, Grigori, and Bilal, who are responsible to run, uh, uh, to run the facility, do training, do, do check the office calibration on a Monday. So they, they do a lot of work to make sure that the facility is running uh, smoothly. Then we have uh, Greg, who, who spoke yesterday, and besides developing a groundbreaking technology, is also helping to run the, the infrastructure for uh, data, data management. And then I'd like to thank you, Chris Russo and uh, his team, who always provide a very useful uh, insight on, uh, on microscope performance. Richard, as well, helps to troubleshoot very complicated uh, uh, problems that we might face. Then we have Andrew Carter for the scientific supervisor, uh, scientific supervision, and then we have a mechanical workshop, electronic workshop, and lab services. These people are actually, they actually make our life a lot easier than for running the facility. And with this, I'll take any question.